It's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Uh, tonight we're going to be continuing on in our study in the book of Genesis. Uh, this is part 26, so we've been here for a while. In case anybody's wondering, we do have on our website, we, we have all the recordings of these. If you go to our website, there's a little box up top that says Audio Visual Room. And you can go there and there's links. So if you want to listen to any of the messages, you can. And of course, you can also get CDs from John. Uh, we've been talking about a sure foundation. And uh, we've been starting off, every time we've been talking in Genesis, we've been starting off with this uh, quote from Henry Morris. And the quote is, One's belief concerning his origin will inevitably determine his belief concerning his purpose and his destiny. That's why we call this a sure foundation. Because if you don't have a good foundation, the building it rests upon it isn't going to stand very well. We need to know that what we read in the book of Genesis about the origin of things is true. Uh, people have tried to say, you know, scientists have tried to say it's not true, and it's it really, you can't believe it. Listen, I believe what God's Word says. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, don't mess with the teachings of science falsely so called. I preached that a couple of times. I might do it again here one of these days with a little presentation. But, but we believe that the Word of God is true. And uh, we stand on that. We're, tonight, we're going to be talking about the generations of Isaac. Okay? That sounds like a really exciting topic, doesn't it? Generations of Isaac. Uh, defining the lineage of the covenant. Now all through this, when we've been reading through these, uh, these passages uh, in these first 25, 26 chapters of Genesis, we've noticed uh, a line uh, going from the very beginning, and I have some names listed up there. At the very beginning, after Adam and Eve sinned, God promised a deliverer. God promised the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head, and the serpent would bruise his heel. And we know, of course, that was the very first promise in all the scriptures of the coming Messiah, or the coming Christ. Now, from that point on, there was a, there was a promise that a deliverer would come, and there was a certain line of people through whom that deliverer would come. Now, I have some listed up there. Adam, of course. He had his son named Seth. Uh, in the lineage of Seth, and there's a, lo a lot of names in between these that we're, I have not included, but some of the main names. Seth, uh, Noah, we know who Noah was. Noah uh, built the ark, of course, when God sent judgment on the world, and there were only eight people saved in all that judgment. Uh, Noah had three sons, and his one son's name was Shem. It was through Shem that the Messiah would come. Eventually, there was a man named Nahor that we talked about last week and his descendants, and then uh, from Nahor came Abram, or Abraham. And from Abraham came Isaac, the seed of promise. Okay? And that's where we jump in here today in Isaiah, uh, yeah, Isaiah, Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to be starting at verse 19. Okay? <clears throat> And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. Now we, we had said, whenever you see that term, these are the generations, that's like a new section. That's like a new, beginning a new set of narratives. Okay? We're skipping over some things. If you go a little earlier on in this chapter, you'll find out that you read about Abraham after his wife Sarah died. He took another wife. And he had other children toward her. We also know that Abraham had another son that was uh, older than Isaac. His name was Ishmael. He was the son of the flesh that we uh, re uh, read about. In verse 5 of chapter 25, it says, Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. Isaac was the main one. It was through Isaac that the seed would come. It was through Isaac that the covenant would be, would be accomplished. Uh, if you drop down a little bit more, uh, uh, in verse 12, we read about the generations of Ishmael. Remember we had said Ishmael was the son of the flesh. When Abraham and Sarah didn't understand how God was going to do what he said he was going to do, and Sarah was barren, 
they decided to help him out a little bit, and Abraham took uh, one of Sarah's handmaidens as a surrogate mother, and she bore him a son named Ishmael, and Abraham for ten years or so thought Ishmael was going to be the, the heir, the inheritor of the promise. But God said, no, he's not the one. God blessed Ishmael because he was the son of Abraham, but he was not the one who was to receive uh, the promise, the stuff. And eventually, Abraham had to cast Hagar, the mother, and Ishmael out of the camp, and we read about that also. But we're not going to spend that much time on Ishmael. We want to drop down to verse 19. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. We read about that last week. The daughter of Bethul, the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban, the Syrian. Now that name Laban will come up later. If you know the story in the book of Genesis, Jacob had his time with Laban, but that's a few chapters away. The generations of Isaac. As we said, this begins a new section of narrative. And it's interesting that when we talk about Isaac, there's really not a lot of time spent on Isaac as a father, as a patriarch. Uh, is, 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 the, the focus more is on his children, is particularly Jacob. But all we know about Isaac is he carried on the seed and so forth. Uh, and he's, he's just kind of there. Uh, but the, it's passing on from, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And Jacob, of course, will become the father of the children, uh, the father of the children of Israel. It says in verse 21, And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. Now, we're seeing a repeated theme, again, as we read through the book of Genesis. It's interesting that, that God never takes the easy way. God never takes the short path. You know, if it's like us, we always look for the quickest way to get from point A to point B. But it seems that God always, always tries to find the way that is the most confounding to our understanding. In these stories that we're reading, we see that there's an impossible situation. Sarah, barren. Rebecca, barren. Not able to have children. There's a promise of offspring. There's a promise of all these children and these nations that are going to come out of his loins, but they can't have any kids. We see that there's prayer made, entreaty made unto God. We see the barrenness healed. And we always see a struggle. And then we always see a promise. We see this in all these stories. We'll see this as we go on a little further. There were two children in her womb. Two twins. They were not identical. As a matter of fact, they were as far apart from each other as you could get. How many people have noticed that with kids sometimes? One can be like, okay. It says in verse 23, when, 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 when this struggle was going on in her womb, it said, it, the word there is really intense, like, now I've never had a birth pain, because I've never had kids, but you women that have birth pains, I guess they're pretty rough. Well, the, the word here is even more intense than that. It says she was, having, she was having problems, and she said, Lord, what is going on inside of me? And here's what God said. He answered her prayer, and he said unto her, two nations are in your womb. The two children are in your womb are going to become great nations of people. And two, and two manner of people shall be separated from your bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder shall serve the younger. Now listen, here's an oracle from God. He's saying, there's going to be two nations coming from these two children. They're going to be antagonistic against each other. And as we read about the history of Jacob and Esau and their descendants, we find this to be true. One will be stronger. The, the promised seed could only come through one of them. Only one of them will be a, would be able to bear the seed that would bring forth the Messiah. And the elder will serve the younger. Here's something else we read about in God's Word all the time. Normally, it's the oldest child that would get all the blessings, but for some reason, God seems to choose the younger one. God seems to choose the one that, is, that the world wouldn't choose. That in, in a natural state of things, we would think, well, who's going to be the inheritor of all this? We would say, well, the one that came out first. But for some reason, God always chooses the ones that nobody else would choose. 
Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Aren't you glad for that? All right. What we see here is a battle. And it's, it's a battle that we read throughout the scriptures. We, we see this personified. We see this presented to us. The battle between the flesh and the spirit. We saw it between Cain and Abel. Remember them? Two brothers. One slew the other. Because one brought an offering. We talked about this Sunday morning. One brought an offering uh, with the right spirit and an offering of worship. The other brought offering the work of his hands. God received one and rejected the other. And Cain, of course, killed his brother. Ishmael and Isaac, they're still fighting. There was, if you read about Isaac, when Isaac was born, Ishmael was not happy. The writing, the writing was on the wall for him. And there was an antagonism between Ishmael and Isaac. So, between Esau and Jacob, these two children in the womb, there would be an antagonism, a struggle. How come nothing good ever comes easy? Nothing good ever comes easy. <laughs> Chapter 24. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Just as God said. And it says, And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. That name Esau means rough. Because when he came out, actually, if you, again, if you look at some of the words, when he came out, he almost looked like an animal. He was covered with this red hair. You know, when I was born, I had black curly hair all the way down. They thought I was a little girl. They did. I saw pictures of it. But he had hair all over his body. <laughs> he was just a hairy baby. Red hair. But he was rough looking. Uh, he was the firstborn. That meant the firstborn would be the one to receive the birthright and the blessing. Now in our day and age, those words might not carry as much weight as they would have back then. But the birthright and the blessing were something, some things to be cherished. And we'll talk about the birthright in just a little bit. Uh, he was covered in red hair. He was the manly one. Even from his birth, it, he appeared to be the, the tough guy. Verse 26. And after that came his brother. And his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old, sixty years old, when he bore them. The word Jacob means supplanter. Or one who trips another in order to take his place. Somebody who lays a trap for somebody else. A con man. You know, a shyster. A wise guy. Because Jacob, when they were coming out, his hand was on his brother's heel. As if you would tr grab somebody's heel to kind of trip him up. That's what they named him. What that thing to name your kid? Jacob. Okay. Now, verse 27. And the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, you talk about a dysfunctional family. Here we go. Dad had his favor, and Mom had hers. And guess who's dad? Who, 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 who's... Who dad's favorite was. Okay? Esau was a cunning hunter. He was a man of the woods. I, I've never been a hunter. My dad wasn't a hunter. Okay? So I never learned how to hunt. And I'm kind of glad I didn't because if I ever shot something and I had to go take his guts out, I'd probably, I'd probably pass out. <laughs> I just don't have a stomach for that kind of stuff. I don't have anything against hunters. But, but, but a hunter, if it... it, it with that term, hunter, reckons back, if you remember all the way back when we were talking about Nimrod, who built the Tower of Babel, built Babylon, he was a mighty hunter. It's kind of associated with that. You know, everything that had to do with the world, he was a, he was a cunning hunter. He was an outdoorsman, a rough guy. And Isaac loved him because he would always get some, get some deer meat and bring it home to Dad, you know. And Dad liked that. Jacob, he was eh, just a homeboy, 
a homebody. You might call him my mama's boy. Tied to mama's apron strings. Okay? Loved by his mama. Loves his, his mother loves him. What a setup. What a picture of two completely opposite, different personalities. Born at the same time. Same mother, same father. Came out of the same womb at the same time. Two completely different people. Because what we see here are, is a picture. I go back to what I said earlier. A picture of the flesh and the spirit. A picture of what it's like to live in the flesh and what it's like to live in the spirit. Now these were two genuine people. This isn't just a, a parable. This is for real. But all through the scriptures we see this dichotomy. Now, it says in verse 29, Jacob sawed pottage, which means, King James English, it means he was, he was, he was cooking some stew, some soup, some stew, some, some lentil soup. It was, it was red. Okay. So Jacob was home cooking, and Esau was out hunting. Okay, they were doing what they did. Jacob was being the homeboy. And, you know, Esau was out getting deer. Okay. Jacob saw Pudge. Esau came in from the field, and Esau, he had had a tough day out in the field. Said that he was faint. Was tired. Wore out. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red stuff. For I am faint, therefore his name is called Edom. The, the people that would come after him were called Edomites. And the word Edom means red. It's, it's related to the word Adam. Adam, Edom, red. Esau was born, he was covered in red. He saw the red stew. He said, give me some of that red stew because I'm ready to pass out. I'm so tired. Feed me. I'm hungry. That name, Edom, the, the nation of Edom that descended from Esau, became a perpetual enemy to the children of Jacob, to the Israelites. And they are today. In fact, many people believe that what, what are called the Palestinians are really descendants of Edom. Herod, King Herod was a descendant of Edom. At that time they called them Idumeans. The descendants of Edom became perpetual enemies of Israel. And still are. And still are. It hasn't changed. Okay? Now look at what Jacob, the old trickster, you know, he could have been a nice guy and said, Sure, Edom. Sure, Esau. Here. Have some, you know, Cincinnati chili or whatever it was. Have some. Here. Sure. You're my brother. But Jacob saw an opportunity as supplanters always do. Have you ever known anybody always look for an opportunity to get over on it? And Jacob said, sell me this day thy birthright. Now again, thus we hear that. We think, well, you know, what's that about? Birthright. But in those days, a birthright was a big thing. The birthright was belonged to the eldest son by birth. That's why they call it birthright. Along with the birthright came excellency, dignity, and power. You would become the head of the family in place of your father when he, when he died. That was your right as the oldest son. Normally, the oldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance. So there was position, there was power, there was money, there was stuff. And in Abraham's line, in particular, there was a spiritual benefit because the eldest, the one who obtained the birthright, was the one through whom Messiah would come. The one through whom the world would be blessed. 
And, and these kids knew about it. I'm sure that Abraham passed that information on to Isaac. I'm sure Isaac passed that, on, that information on to his kids. That, that it was through them that this promise would come from Yahweh. The eldest son would become the priest of his family and the right to become an ancestor to Messiah. This is what was included in the birthright. This is what, ate, what, what Jacob was trying to buy off of Esau for a bowl of soup. Sometimes we sell things cheap. Have you ever sold something and you wish you could have it back? Have you ever sold something for a lot less than what it was worth? Esau had the birthright. And he was willing. Listen to what it says. And Esau says, I'm at the point to die. No, he wasn't. He was just hungry. But come on, oh, I'm so hungry I could die. And what profit is this birthright to me? Oh, you've got to listen to what he's saying. The right to have the Messiah come through my loins? What's that worth? To be the priest of my house? To, be, to take over from my father? To be the head? To have the dignity and the excellency of, of being the head of my family? I'm hungry. What do we see? We see the flesh and the spirit. How many of us have a one time or another in our life sold away something spiritual for something carnal? Sometimes we do it every day. We deal, God gives us spiritual blessings in heavenly places and we treat them like they're nothing, like they're wasted newspaper. But boy, the stuff of the world we just fall in love with. Because it feeds our belly. Makes us feel good for a while. But see, that birthright, see, that wasn't something that they could grab a hold of right then and there. But see, Jacob had enough spiritual, and Jacob was no saint. I mean, he had his, his issues. But Jacob had enough sense, had enough spiritual sense to understand that the birthright was something that was in the future. Esau said, I'm at the point to die. What is this birthright good for me. And Jacob said, swear to me this day. And he swore to him. And he sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Look at those. He ate, he drank, he got up, he left. And thus Esau despised his birthright. We're going to see more of the consequences of this when we go into the next part of the narrative. When Jacob stole the blessing, that's another, that's another story for another night. But we see here the difference between those that have a heart for God and those that have a heart for the things of this world. And we see. I'm going I'm to say a word tonight. I want you to hear this word. The word is called election. You ever hear that word? We're going to be hearing a lot lately for next year. But I'm not talking about that kind of election. God's election. You know, some folks believe that God chooses some people to go to heaven, God chooses some people to go to hell. And they call that election. I don't believe that's God's election. I don't believe God chooses anybody to go to hell. The Bible says, if it were up to Him, everybody would come to Him. He'd love to have everybody get saved. But when we talk about election, we're talking about God's choosing those He wants for His service. Election always applies to service. There are two brothers here. One of them has to bear the seed of the Messiah. But we're going to find out something. Turn with me. The consequences of Esau's decision. 
Turn with me to Malachi. We'll look at a couple passages of Scripture. Malachi is the very last book in the Old Testament. So it's easy to find. I think. Okay, it is. In chapter 1 of Malachi. It started verse 2. Malachi was written... Excuse me, about 400 years before Christ. And the people of Israel had kind of gotten into like a religious kind of, you know, rut. They were going through the motions. They had learned how not to practice idolatry because that got them in a lot of trouble. But they were going through the motions. And look what he says. In, in, in verse 2 of chapter 1 of Malachi, God says to the people, I have loved you, says the Lord. Yet you say, wherein has you loved us? The people were saying, well, you love us. Was not, now listen to what the prophet says. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet I loved Jacob. I loved Jacob. I chose Jacob. Before they were born, I pronounced Jacob as the one through who the seed would come. Did God know? We know that God knew the choice that Esau would make. And he put his blessing on Jacob. He says, Was not Esau Jacob's brother? And the Lord yet, uh, says the Lord, Yet I love Jacob. Verse 3. And I hated Esau. Wait a minute. God, what, God hates people? You can't love if you don't hate. He says, And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom says, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus says the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord has indignation forever. He's speaking about his offspring. The people of Esau, the descendants of Esau, were cursed because of his despising the birthright. They could have been the ones through whom Messiah would come. But that's not the way it happened. Because Esau didn't want any part of his birthright. He was hungry. You see what happens when we follow after the flesh and not after the spirit. We lose our claim to spiritual blessing. Look at Romans chapter 9. And there, there's a lot more to say to that. I'm just kind of skipping through. Romans chapter 9. We're going to start with verse 6. Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul is talking about his, the nation of Israel. The children of Israel, his countrymen. Let's we'll start at verse 6. Well, let's, let's back up. Let's, let's start at that. Verse 3, verse 2 of chapter 9. That I have great heaviness for continual sorrow in my heart. The Apostle Paul is writing this. For I could wish that myself were cursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises who are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. He's talking about the nation of Israel. Not as though the word of God has taken that effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, those are not the children of God. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. I'm just reading all this to get down to where I want to get. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. We read about that a few weeks ago. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calls. It was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved. But Esau, have I hated. A perpetual example of the lost man, Esau. Forever, 
as an example, if you want to look in the Scripture, somebody who was lost, somebody who chose to follow the ways of the flesh instead of the ways of God, go to Esau. A perpetual example of what it means to turn your back on God. To throw away everything that He has promised to bless you with. Finally, one more, one more passage. In Hebrews chapter 12. Just to see the, the, the consequence of selling his birthright. Hebrews chapter 12. In verses 16 and 17. It says this. Oh, let's, just, let's back up to verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. We ought to stop right there. But that's not the, that's not the message tonight. Just think about that one with me. Without holiness, you're not going to see God. If you're not holy, you're not seeing God. Is that what that says? That's not the message tonight, but you might as well think about that for a little bit. Verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He did an action that he could not repent of. You need to, listen, selling your birthright is a heavy thing. People talk about, whether well, you're going to lose your salvation. I don't think you can lose it. But I wonder if you can sell it away. What's your eternity worth? What's your salvation worth? Esau had the birthright. He was going to be the head of his family. He could have been the one through whom Messiah would come. Yet he chose instead to follow the ways of the world. And though he cried afterwards, when he realized what he had lost, it was too late. It was too late. As long, listen, as long as we're breathing on this earth, we have a hope of repentance and forgiveness. There's nothing, there's no sin we could commit other than the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is, I think this is a picture of it. I think this is a, about as much a picture you can get of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit as anybody can give you. Esau. He had everything. And he sold it for nothing. As long as we're breathing, we have the opportunity to repent and be saved. I'm going to tell you something. There's going to come a time when if you go pass off into eternity, you'll cry and repent and cry for all of eternity. And there will be no hope. It will be too late. It was too late for Esau. He became an example of somebody that has crossed over a line that could not be reversed. Sold his birthright. And the proof of it, if you go back to Genesis and look at the very end of chapter 26. Look what happened. And Esau was 40 years old. Oh wait. Your page is flopping. Genesis chapter 26 and verse 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith the daughter of Beeri the Hittite and Bashemath the daughter of Elon the Hittite. He married women who were not of his countrymen. He married outside, outside of the covenant people. He profaned what would have been the line. Now we know, as we're going to read on, that Jacob had to travel back to where Uncle Laban lived to find himself a bride. We'll read about that later. He kept it in the family. But it says that Esau married outside. And in verse 35 it says, Which were a grief of mind unto Isaac, 
and to Rebekah. The consequence, the final consequence of him selling his birthright is that he sold out his heritage and defiled his line. It might not seem like much to us. But to that family at that time, with the promise, the covenant that God had given them, it's like he did, the, he did the stuff that you read about in Romans chapter 1. He basically shook his fist at God and said, I'm going to do what I want to do. And he did. And he paid the price. And his descendants are still paying the price. How important it is. It's so important. If we're going to grab a hold of anything tonight, how important it is to realize, to hold on to what God has given us. Listen, I'm going to tell you, what God has given you might not look like the biggest, best thing right now. It might not be meeting all your physical and your, you know, your temporal needs right now. But I'm, I'm going to tell you something. What He has promised for us in eternity is so much greater than anything we could even imagine on this place. Yet, so often, we get so tempted to just sell away What's ours in Christ for a bowl of soup? That's what we do. What's your, what's your eternity worth? What's your salvation worth? Why is it sometimes we allow ourselves to live lives and, and, we, and we feel separated from God? There's a, there's a blockage there. Why? Because we've allowed ourselves to wallow in the world. We say, oh God, I don't feel your presence. Oh God, I don't... Well, get out of the world. Get back in the Word. Start walking in the Spirit. Start... Start doing the things that God said to do. Instead of selling them away for a bowl of soup. Speaking of Esau, an expositor named... Grant said this. Esau marrying these Canaanite women. He said, this is the natural sequel of profanity which could esteem the birthright at the value of a mess of pottage. These 40 years are a significant hint to us as of a completed probation. In his two wives married at once, he refuses at once the example and counsel of his father, and by his union with Canaanite women, disregarded the divine sentence, and shows unmistakably the innermost recesses of his heart. Ultimately, you can play church, you can do all you want to, but you know what? It'll come out. Your true self will, will, will show itself. Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. Where are we as individuals? Your true self will come out. It really will. I pray tonight, Father, that as we've read about this tragic story, of how a man sold away everything that was his for nothing, for a temporal blessing. He sold away all the stuff, all the eternal blessings that were his. He gave them all away for nothing. And Father, yet every day sometimes we find ourselves dealing away the blessings that God has promised us for a little bit of this and a little piece of that and a little bit of this over here. And all those things that are ours in the Spirit, we find we've, we can't see them, we can't feel them, we can't touch them, because we've allowed ourselves to get caught in all the, all the stuff of the world. Father, I thank you that because of the blood of Jesus, as long as we're breathing, we always have room to repent. We always have room to come back. Your, your loving kindness always draws us back and welcomes us back. And, and your chastising love draws us back and, and welcomes us back as long as we're breathing. But oh God, if we cross over into eternity without having come to you, we'll find ourselves repenting 
where there is no repentance. We'll find ourselves crying with tears for what we gave away, but can never get back. Father, I pray tonight, as we prepare to leave this place, Lord, something in your word just quicken our hearts tonight. But to realize that what you have for us is so much more precious than what the world has. I want to ask you tonight, and we don't normally, you know, have a, like a prayer time, but I just want to ask you tonight, wherever, wherever you're at in your walk with God, if you, if you have a walk with God, I want to say this prayer. I want to say as much for myself as for anybody in here. Father, help us recognize those areas that we've sold out. Father, there's nothing more precious than the promises that we have in you. And Father, some of us, many of us at one time or another, we've let go of some of those, or we've forgotten those promises, or maybe we've counted them as not, as, as not real or not... Father, I pray that you would help us wherever we're at. Wherever we're at in our walk with you, Father, that we'll get one step closer to you. If we're walking in the wrong direction, Father, we'll stop and we'll turn and we'll begin to walk back. Because even as that father waited for that son that had been gone off into a far land, he's, Father, you're waiting for those who have, who have wandered away. Father, I pray that nobody in the sound of my voice or nobody that we have contact with will ever find themselves in a place where they cry out and they'll hear, too late. Father, send salvation now in the name of Jesus. If you're not saved, you need to be. And if you're saved, you need to be actively, actively living and praying and breathing and eating and sleeping and drinking Jesus Christ every day. You need to be walking in holiness because without holiness nobody will see God. You need to be examining yourself every day. Getting under the blood of Jesus at the cross of Calvary to get your sins forgiven and cleansed. That we may enjoy the blessings. That we may enjoy the fellowship with the Father. Father, help us have that on our minds each and every day. We ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's children say. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yes. Um, does God have anybody that he hates? The Bible says that he hates the workers of iniquity. Now, it also says that he, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, I, I often said this. For a person that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, there's only one place you'll find the love of God. That's on the cross. For believers, we find you know, the love of God is everywhere. But for the, for the, for the person who is, who is lost, there's only one place where the love of God is manifest unto them, and that is on the cross of Calvary. So he hates the workers of iniquity, but he loved them in that he sent his son. So it's... Does that answer your question. It's kind of hard for us to fathom it. How can you love somebody and hate them at the same time? He hates the workers of iniquity. And what's he hates sin. But he made a way for a sinner to become the same through faith in his blood. That's his love.